Good afternoon, this is Jim McKay speaking to you live from the Darlington International Raceway in Darlington, South Carolina. We're watching the progress of the Rebel 400 stock car race, and what a race it is right at this moment. Three cars are battling for the lead. Number 71 is the leader, that's Bobby Isaac. About 50 yards behind him is car number 17, David Pearson, and right on the tail of David Pearson is number 43, Richard Petty. Number 27, Cale Yarbrough, is in fourth position, but he is a lap behind. So at this moment, it is a three-car race in the Rebel 400. 161 laps have gone by of a scheduled 291. The weather, very hot for automobile racing. It's a hot early summer South Carolina day. The temperature about 90, a breeze blowing that helps the spectators, but helps the men in the automobiles, and the automobiles of themselves, precious little. A cloudless sky, and as we said, tremendous racing today. Standing with me right now is a man who has won the famous Southern 500 race, the Liberty race, on this track, was placed the NASCAR Grand National Champion, Ned Jarrett. How do you like the racing right now? It's been a real fine race, Jim, and it looks like there's plenty of competition left here this evening. These three fellows who are out front have been in many close battles in the past, and they're just renewing some of those tight battles they've had. Boy, they sure are. And when we have time here to break away from the actual racing, we're going to bring you up to date on some of the things that have already happened. Once again, however, we want to set the leaders. In first place, number 71 is Bobby Isaac. In second place, number 17 is David Pearson. And in third place, number 43 is Richard Petty. Three of the most popular idols in the sport of Southern stock car racing. Up until a few minutes ago, Pete Hamilton, one of the few northerners in this business, and the young man who won the Daytona 500 and the big race at Talladega, was locked in this battle. It was a four-way battle at that time. Pete, however, spun out a few minutes ago and is out of the race. Pete Hamilton right now is down in the pits, and our colleague Bob Montgomery is going to try to have a word with him. Bob? Pete, you are down the, the back stretch, and all of a sudden it happened. What did happen? Well, Bob, I guess I blew a right rear tire, and the uh, car got a little bit sideways and tried to back it into the corner and see if I could save it, but uh, I got out of the way of uh, everyone else, but uh, I ended up on the inside guardrail instead of the outside. I guess I tore up the car a little bit. What happened? Did you run over something? Cut the tire or what? Yes, I think so. I think I cut the tire going down the front stretch, and uh, I believe that the, actually the tire went flat going into the first and second turn. Then the inner line of blue going down the back stretch. How about the rest of the afternoon, Pete? Will you stand by to relieve Richard? Well, I don't believe Richard's going to need any relief, but I sure will be here if he needs it. Now back to Jim McKay. All right, thank you very much, Bob. And so there you have the opening scene as we come here to, to cover live and in color the Rebel 400 as ABC's Wide World of Sports continues to span the globe to bring you the constant variety of sport, the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat. The human drama of athletic competition. We'll have plenty of it today on ABC's Wide World of Sports. Brought to you by Allstate Insurance Company. For insurance to protect your home, your life, health, and business too, talk to the good hands people. By Capri, imported by Lincoln Mercury. It's the success part of the decade in Europe and now available in America in limited quantities. And by Palmetto Rapid Shave. Menthol Mint, Juicy Lime, Morning Fresh Regular. Rapid shave smells so good you won't want to shave it off. We're back again at Darlington, South Carolina. Jim McKay reporting along with former NASCAR driving great Ned Jarrett. You're looking at the lead car of the race. That's Bobby Isaac in car number 71. Bobby, who we had heard in the lead after the spin out of Pete Hamilton, about which you heard a little bit from Pete himself just a minute or so ago. This was a race in which Charlie Glotzbach of Indiana won the pole position and took the lead in the early going. However, after about four laps, Bobby Allison, car number 22, went on past him, and so did David Pearson. And for quite a while, it was Bobby Allison, number 22, and Pearson, number 17, who were battling for the lead, with Allison having all the better of it. On lap 81, however, it was Pearson passing Allison and taking the lead. There were no yellow flags until lap 109. That was from Leroy Yarbrough, winner of almost $190,000 last year, the winner of this race the last time it was held. spun on the home stretch in a fairly spectacular moment, and he was out, and there was another yellow flag. Then on lap 145, Bobby Allison, leading the race at the time, had 
trouble with his car, had to drop out of the race. And on lap 150, Pete Hamilton spun on turn three at a time when he was in second place just behind David Pearson. So those are the yellow flags we have had so far in the race. Ned, we now have 171 laps going by, 172 make that, which leaves us with uh, uh, something less than 120 laps left to go in the race. What do you foresee from this point on? What are the possibilities of what might happen? Well, of course, we have the first three cars still in the same lap, Jim, and they will most likely have to make at least two more pit stops. Of course, pit stops are always important in a race of this type. We've seen some rather lengthy pit stops, especially those that were made under the caution flag here today. Of course, the fellows don't have to work quite as hard then, but even under the green flag, and I suppose it's partly due to the heat here today. This is one of the hottest days we've had during the 1970 season, and the fellows are under a lot of strain and stress down in the pit, so when it comes time for other pit stops, this could be a very important factor, but the three cars out front now are running very well. We might say something about the Darlington track. This is considered one of the more spectacular tracks on the NASCAR trail. It was the first of the so-called super speedways, meaning generally tracks of more than a mile in length on the NASCAR circuit. Way back in 1950, they started the Southern 500. There are problems on this track. It used to be they picked up what they called the Darlington Stripe from scraping the wall very often in the third turn. Then they remodeled turns three and four. And it turns out now that the problems are in turn four instead of in turn three. So it didn't change the situation too much. Jim, it's a very now, a little bit of, Excuse me, Ned, but just a little bit before this race began, Bob Montgomery had an interesting talk with the man who's now leading, Bobby Isaac. And among the questions he asked him was a very interesting one. Bobby, each speedway has its own thing, which sets it apart from any other speedway. What has been your biggest problem here at Darty? Well, not any one uh, particular thing, except just the racetrack in general, I guess. Uh, when I first got to Grand National Racing, Darlington was one of the first super speedways that I came to. And uh, I think I kind of got scared of Darlington. I, I mean, I hate to say it because I've run racetracks all over the world and I've never been scared of any of it. I think Darlington put a little bit of fear in my mind because I had to run so close to the wall in the third turn. And I never seem to get rid of this now. They did redo the racetrack and uh, made it uh, just almost like other racetracks where you didn't have to sit against the wall. But I never seemed to get rid of the, the bug that was bugging me or whatnot, except uh, when I came down the road for this race, I thought about it a lot. And I accepted the fact that they was going to keep this racetrack here and I was going to have to get used to running it. And uh, I'm running better at this race than I ever run before. That was Bobby Isaac, but there's been a crash on the home stretch, a car upside down. And that's a Richard blue Petty. car, it is Richard Petty. And there, that looks like Richard's helmet sticking out of the car, and he certainly appears to be unconscious. The pit crew running out, the yellow flag of course is out. This could be a very bad accident to one of the best known race drivers in the world, Richard Petty of Randleman, North Carolina, son of Lee Petty, and his father, I'm sure, is one of the men coming out there now, along with his brother Maurice, who also works on the pit crew. Fortunately, the car did not catch fire and possibly that's a tribute once again to the fuel cells that are used nowadays, Ned. Yes, it is, Jim. That, uh, of course, it's mandatory that all the cars have the fuel cells. And in an accident of this type, it's a big help. There's no doubt about it. Richard wrecked where he did. You can see some of the damage on the pit wall. And he had a similar accident earlier in the week in a different car, Jim, during just after qualifying. Of course, it was not nearly as serious as the one we see here. Well, the look at that pit wall gives you some idea of the impact with which Richard Betty hit it. He actually cracked the wall, almost went all the way through it, and had he gone through that or, or slipped up over it, it could have been a, a real tragedy in the pit area. It's However, certain, go ahead, Ned. It certainly could have, but it is, NASCAR requires that the pit area be separated by a pit wall such as we see here and it takes a tremendous lick to do the damage to this wall that it did. Of course he was running perhaps 150 miles an hour and a 4,000 pound automobile going at this speed can do a lot of damage. Ned, uh, we won't try to look forward for, on what might have happened to Richard Petty except to try to report the impact of the car as we see it. Uh, obviously you saw how hard he hit the wall. Also it appears that the roof is caved in a bit, and even the roll cage might have given a little bit, do you think? Jim, with the lick, as Richard Petty has taken here, it's almost impossible to have put a set of roll bars in a car that would withstand this kind of punishment. 
of course, uh, when the car turned upside down, which is very unusual that you see one of these cars turned upside down, but when he got into that wall the way that he did, it, uh, of course, shifted the weight of the car around and resulted in him turning over down the straightaway. And there is a tremendous amount of pressure put on the roll bars in a case like this. So that is the factual situation as we know it up to this moment. There is the ambulance out on the track right now. And as far as I can see, do they have him out of the car? I can't see as yet. I believe they do have Yes, there he is. He's in the ambulance, and Richard Petty will be rushed to the hospital. The safety precautions here is that all of the NASCAR tracks are on the ball. They're Jim, that's uh, Maurice Petty, Richard's brother, riding in the back of the ambulance as we see it going into the track hospital. The race will continue, incidentally. We are operating under a yellow flag here. They have not red flagged the race. Pit stops are actually going on around that wrecked car of Richard Petty's as drivers continue to take advantage of the yellow flag to improve their position in the race. 179 laps have gone by. The race is scheduled for 291. But it's going to take a little while of racing under the yellow flag to get this uh, racing car off the track. I've never seen one of your NASCAR cars crumple quite that way from top to bottom though, in the roof area. Neither have I, Jim. It's one of the most uh serious accidents as far as automobile damage is concerned that I have seen. You can see that the left door is completely torn away. Of course, you can see the roll bar cage, which protects the driver on the left side. And I'm sure this was a big help to Richard in there, but it did actually completely tear the door away from and the door was welded shut or bolted shut and welded to the roll bars. Well, now he hit that wall shortly after he came out of the fourth turn. We have said a couple of times earlier in our broadcast here that the fourth turn has become the dangerous one here at Darlington after they straightened out the third and changed things. Here comes some, move, uh, some word on Richard. He is conscious in the ambulance and is moving his arm. So Richard Fetty is conscious at this moment as he is being taken to the hospital. What his injuries are, of course, we have no idea. We'll be getting word from the hospital just as soon as we possibly can. Ned, we were talking about the nature of the accident that did happen coming out of the fourth turn. Could you speculate as to what might have happened to Richard? In talking with some of the drivers earlier, of course, they've changed the track since I last drove it, Jim. And, of course, you would make a different approach now. But they say that as you approach the third turn, after, after you go into the third turn, I should say, and approach the fourth turn, you would start picking up speed and setting yourself to come off the number four turn. And if you don't go fast enough, accelerate hard enough coming off the fourth turn, that you're subject to, when you get out there, it's a natural reaction that you would press heavier on the accelerator, which would cause the front end to push and might cause the front end to go into the wall. And if you get on it, if you get on it too heavy, the back end would break loose. So it's a tough turn to come off of. All right, Ned, we have some word from the pit area from Bob Montgomery. Bob, what's the story? Standing right alongside me is Richard's brother, Maurice. Maurice, it happened so fast, I doubt if you know what happened, but what is Richard's condition, could you tell? Well, he's laying there broken now. The clock is uh, left on. They see the strong rear bladder broke, and they get in, they're cutting his uniform away to get into it. His, yeah. head's, his head's beat on bloody, and his eyes hurt a little bit. He'll be all right, though. But he is talking. Yeah, he's talking. He knows everybody. You look pretty beat yourself. Yeah, <laughs> long run. Now back to you, Jim. Bob, that's the best word we could have had. Uh, I'm sure you could tell from the tone in which Ned and I had been talking earlier that it certainly was one of the worst looking accidents we've seen on the NASCAR circuit in a long time. However, the immediate word now, as you heard it from Richard Petty's brother, is that he is conscious, he has a bloody face, he's having a little trouble seeing but can see, and apparently has trouble with his left arm. Uh, he said what, it's either broken or what? Or cut, sprained. I couldn't understand, or sprained. But that is a lot less than it could have been in a crash like this. So there's the automobile, and you can almost graphically see the tribute to the roll cage that is built into these, these, these cars. He was on that roof, you can see that would be absolutely flat. It would be squashed flat were it not for the roll cage inside the car. Were it not for the fuel cells, it's quite possible that with an impact like that, he could have caught fire, and he was unconscious. Jim, I don't here is the, just one second, Ned, we're trying to follow the story pictorially as it goes, and uh, here is the hospital at the track here, an emergency hospital, where they can make their first readings, and where the track doctor can say whether to keep him here, send him to the hospital in Darlington or Florence, or whatever. It's a very good setup. Excuse me, Ned. Well, while you're commenting on that, this is one of the big advantages that a race driver has, and uh, participating on a track of this type is that they do have uh, as much safety equipment as can possibly be brought here and of course trained personnel to handle all of the equipment. I was going to comment before you went to the hospital scene that I believe that it would be impossible to wreck a highway 
automobile in this form and anyone live in such an accident. But there again, with the safety features that are built in to these automobiles, this is the reason that these features are built there, is to help the driver in a circumstance such as this. Another point might be that uh, these men on the racetrack, the men who are still racing, are skilled in their profession almost beyond anything you can understand as an ordinary driver. There might be a tendency on the part of some people to think of a stock car race driver as a young hot rod. Just look at their ages to begin with and you'll see that isn't true. I think Pete Hamilton's about the youngest of the big time drivers and he's 27 years old. These yes. are men in their late 20s and their early and middle 30s who have been schooled and trained and are the very best at their craft. They wouldn't do anything like this on a highway. What is it like, what is the feeling or can you say, Ned, in the minds of the other drivers out there, as the race goes on, they see the condition of Richard's car, they probably don't have an idea of what has happened to him. Do you think about the accident, or can you keep your mind purely on the race? Well, they would all be concerned of Richard's condition, but their pit crews will most likely keep them posted as far as his condition is concerned, or at least the fact that he is uh, conscious and talking to people, and uh, this would relieve their mind, and then they could get their mind back on the business. Richard Petty's car being towed off the racetrack. Again, he is conscious. Apparently, he is all, all right. The worst they can foresee at this moment is a possible broker, broken arm. And we'll be back for more of the live racing from Darlington in a minute. South Carolina, this is Jim McKay reporting along with Ned Jarrett on the Rebel 400. There's been a tremendous accident to Richard Petty. He has been taken to the track hospital. There is the guardrail uh, guarding the pit area, the pit wall, actually. You can see that he almost went through it. Had he gone through it, there could have been real disaster here, but it is made to take an impact just that hard. It was hit as hard as it could possibly be, uh, head on. The report on Richards that we've had so far was from his brother Maurice, who went into the track hospital, and he reported that it looked like perhaps nothing worse than a broken or sprained arm, but that Richard's face was bloody, and he was having some difficulty seeing, but was able to see and talk and was conscious. Now, right now, Bob Montgomery is down in the pit area with Lynn Kugler, vice president of NASCAR, who has now just come out of the track hospital and may have further word. Bob? Lynn, uh, you just come out of the hospital. What is the situation there? Uh, Bob, I'm very encouraged. Uh, Richard looked very alert. He was conscious. Uh, he was speaking to his father and the doctor. They were examining his shoulder, and they were checking his pulse at the present time. If you'll turn behind, Bob, you can see they're just uh, removing him to take him into the hospital for x-rays. Uh, he was talking, and he was very alert, and uh, surprisingly enough, Bob, he looks like he's in very fine shape considering the fact that that car flipped about three or four times and landed on his roof after he took out about 10 foot of the pit wall. Richard now being placed in the ambulance. They will take him downtown to the hospital. Of course, here we're equipped for any emergency, but they always uh, like to take uh, a driver who's been in a wreck of this sort down for x-rays. In the front seat, you see Richard's wife, Linda, uh, sitting in the center of the front seat in the white dress, and of course, very much concerned. Richard, uh, in the car now, his father was also standing alongside. Uh, I see Lee back here right now. I don't know whether we can uh, say anything to him. Of course, uh, they're very upset right now. Uh, I'll check. Lee, do you have a word for the television audience? How is Richard? Hey, I believe he's going to be all right. Thank you very much. Lee Petty, the father of Richard Petty, and uh, he perhaps will go along to the hospital along with uh, Richard's family. That's the scene down here, Jim. Now back to you. Thanks very much, Bob. Uh, Lee Petty, the father who was talking there just a moment ago, is a man who knows all about spectacular accidents. When he was a driver himself, he was involved in one of the wildest and luckiest, I suppose, of all time at Daytona when he went right out of the, the racetrack and into the parking lot, didn't he, uh, Ned? That was in 1961, Jim, and it was one of the most spectacular accidents in NASCAR history. Uh, Lee was injured and uh, was laid up for a while in the hospital, but he came back and drove some after that and then decided to retire not too long after that. And so there is the report as we have it at this moment. The cars are still operating under the yellow flag on the racetrack. And remember that David Pearson is the leader and Bobby Isaac is in second place now. And with Richard Petty out there, the only cars on the same lap. However, remember that all of the reports you have heard are from the father and the brother of the race driver involved and from an official of NASCAR who is not a physician nor are any of them pretending to be. Uh, their reports are uh, secondhand. They have been eyewitnesses, uh, but they are not official. The official word will come from the men in the hospital as to whether there might be any internal injuries or anything that doesn't show at this uh, time on Richard Petty. 
Right now, however, for Richard, it is away from the Donington International Raceway in a way he certainly had not had planned or foreseen to the hospital. His day uh, is done. We certainly hope that the reports we have are accurate. If they are, he may not be off the trail very long. On the racetrack, there you see the skid marks where he headed into the wall. They're still cleaning up, putting down sand because there was oil spilled around out of his car when it went upside down. Now you see that he was, he, uh, he hit the wall out of the fourth turn, I think, didn't he? Yes. Yeah, and then came right down into the pit wall. Evidently, when he hit the outside wall, it, it turned the car completely in the direction of the inside wall. And it, it appears as if he hit it head on which is the worst way to hit it. He did. You can see there's a 90 degree angle between the skid marks of the tires and the pit wall. It was the ultimate test for the pit wall, and it held, but just about. Twice this week, Richard has hit the pit wall there, by the way. He did it earlier on Wednesday. Petty came out and qualified his regular car, seventh fastest, but then in practice, he hit the wall in the same place here. Yes, and I'm sure when he comes back here again, Jim, that that, that wall is going to have a real special significance. It's ironic that he would hit it twice in the same week, and of course in two different cars. That's right, because after hitting it the first time, his regular car was incapacitated. He then had to bring his car that he normally uses only on shorter racetracks and use that car today. There's Bobby Isaac going by in number 71. Remember that the leader at this moment is David Pearson in car number 17, followed by Bobby Isaac in car number 71. They are the only ones on the same lap. However, in third place is Cale Yarbrough in car number 27. And those of you at home who may be saying, hey, they're wrong. Cale Yarbrough drives car number 21 all the time. No, we're not wrong, wrong on this occasion. Cale Yarbrough is in car number 27, which is normally driven by Donnie Allison. Cale's car, for rather complicated reasons, was not brought here to Darlington. Donnie's car was available because Donnie is going to race at Indianapolis and is out there practicing today. So Cale went into Donnie Allison's car and is in third place at the moment. Buddy Baker in fourth place in car number six uh, is three laps down. Cale is only one lap down. And so the race goes on as we stand by for the resumption of green flag racing in the Rebel 400. There is another look at the leaders and we'll be back for live racing at Darlington in another minute. Again, we return live to the Darlington International Raceway. They are still operating under the yellow flag after the crash that sent Richard Petty to the hospital. The leader, they now say, is Bobby Isaac, who has moved ahead on a pit stop basis of David Pearson. Bob Montgomery is down in the pit area. Let's go down there. Well, I don't know about you, but I'm not hearing Bob right now, and I don't think he believes that he is being heard. Let's go back to the racetrack right now. There is Bobby Isaac in car number 71. He is the leader. 190 laps have now been completed. That means 101 laps remain in the race of this live action. Leroy Yarbrough, if you're wondering where some of the other more prominent drivers are, Leroy Yarbrough crashed on lap 109 was not injured, but is out of the race. Benny Parsons spun out in the home stretch on lap 135. Cale Yarborough is doing okay in that car number 27, Donnie Allison's car that he is, is driving this afternoon. There you see the starter with the yellow flag, and he is not showing any signs at this moment of putting out the green. He seems to be in a fairly relaxed uh, situation under the yellow. There's a worker still walking on the home stretch, but just one man, so could be we'll get it soon. That's uh, John Bruner Sr., who is the field manager for NASCAR. Jim, and I think he just went up to take a look at the area where Richard Petty's car was wrecked to see if everything was in safe condition for safe racing. Meanwhile, there is Bobby Isaac. Remember, he is the leader in the race, and should he win this race today, depending on where Richard Petty is placed, even though he didn't finish the race, he could get a place and win points, but it could be that Bobby Isaac will move ahead of Richard Petty in the year-long battle for the Grand National title. That's the biggest title there is in the NASCAR sport, and Ned Jarrett, who's sitting with me today, won that title twice. Must be quite a thrill, Ned. It certainly is, Jim, and these fellows fight hard for it because there's a lot of prestige involved and also a lot of money involved. And going into this race today, Isaac was 54 points behind Richard Petty, with the winner getting 150 points and decreasing three points each position. Isaac would need to finish 19 positions ahead of Petty to take over the lead. Well, they've been given one lap, so they'll be racing when they come around the next time.
and the leader as they start will be this car, Bobby Isaac, number 71. The car alongside of 54 is not in second place. Don't worry about him. The next car to look for is number 17, and there he comes into the picture. That is David Pearson. He is the one in second place, and only those two cars are on the same lap. This could be a tremendous battle from here on. There's a look at David Pearson. Down south, the, the only name he has to have on the top of his car is not David Pearson, just David. They know who that is. They certainly do, Jim. He's been around racing for many years. Of course, he is the current Grand National Champion, has been for the last two years. A tremendous competitor. So battling for the lead, we will have the defending Grand National Champion and a man who could be this year's champion. The green flag is out. They're racing again at Darlington. 192 laps, 193 laps have now gone by. Bobby Isaac, Robert Vance Isaac of Catawba, North Carolina, the father of three children, 36 years old, man who's come close many times but has not quite won the big ones in his sport. Jim, he only has one 500-mile win to his credit, which came in Bryan, Texas last December. He's a very determined young man, and he would certainly like to win at Darlington. Richard Brooks in car number 32, by the way, almost pulled out of the race earlier, pulled behind the pit wall, but they did some repairs to his car, and he's now back in fourth place in the race, all those three laps behind the leader. And Jim, on that restart, he passed Bobby Isaac, and so actually uh, he is only two laps, he's almost three laps, but it should a caution flag come out, he'd get to go all the way around and make up one of those laps because he is sitting immediately in front of the leader right now. He has, in fact, unlapped himself. So the car right in front of the leader, number 32 there, is Richard Brooks, who was the NASCAR Rookie of the Year last year, and a promising, most promising driver for the future. Bobby Isaac trying to gain that lap on him again. Just two cars on the same lap again. Bobby Isaac and David Pearson. And David Pearson is right behind Bobby right now. Jim, we notice how close Pearson runs to the wall, and not only in the third and fourth turn, but as we see him go into this first turn, he's going in through there now, he gets very high uh, in the turn, and he's had some trouble with that wall this week. He's hit it almost every day in practice, but we haven't seen him hit it as many times here today because they've made some adjustments on the car. Matter of fact, David's car was one of the few top cars we've ever seen start a NASCAR race already beat up. The right rear of his car hit the wall so many times that his father to fix it, it wasn't hurting anything. So he started with a crumpled right rear. Isaac is the leader, though. David Pearson is second. And in a minute, minute there'll be more live racing from Darlington, South Carolina. Again, we're back live and in color at Darlington, South Carolina. Jim McKay reporting along with Ned Jarrett and Bob Montgomery on the Rebel 400, where a crowd still sits quite stunned, I should think, after the spectacular crash right in front of the main grandstand by one of the all-time favorites of stock car racing, Richard Petty. He has been taken to the hospital, if you are not with us earlier, and first reports indicate that his injuries are not too bad. He could have a broken arm. Nothing else is evident at this time. He is conscious and has been talking to his brother and to his father on the way to the hospital. In the race, the leader is Bobby Isaac in car number 71. There he is in second place. Number 17 is David Pearson. They're the only cars on the same lap, but they're very close to each other, as you can see. We have another race result for you at Lime Rock, Connecticut this afternoon in the Trans Am race. Arnelli Jones won the race up there this afternoon in New England in a Mustang. And while we're talking about up north, we would hope that our colleague Chris Kamaki, whom you probably noticed is not with us this afternoon, is feeling a little better. Chris has been in the hospital with mononucleosis and was scheduled to go home today. I hope that he's home watching in his New Jersey mansion. And a quick congratulations while we're at it to the New York Knickerbockers. I hope you saw that last night. Was that some ball game? The New York Knicks destroying the Los Angeles Lakers and winning the championship of the National Basketball Association. Right now, however, this is live. This is this moment on a hot 90-degree afternoon in South Carolina. North Carolina against South Carolina. Bobby Isaac of Catawba in the north of Carolina going against David Pearson of Spartanburg in the south. And boy, plenty of North Carolinians and South Carolinians rooting against each other in the stands here, Ned. Yes, they do, Jim. And these two fellows are very good friends. They've raced together for many years before entering the Grand National Division. They raced in some of NASCAR's lesser divisions, such as the late model and the 
modified division, late model sportsman, I should have said, and modified division. So they've done a lot of racing together. There is the leader again. A moment ago, you saw car number six, Buddy Baker. He's in fifth place at the moment. Buddy had an unscheduled pit stop earlier, uh, Jim. It's one reason that he's as far back as he is. We've seen a lot of smoke coming from this car. In fact, we thought the engine had blown, but they did some work on it and got him back into the action. He's running very well now. By the way, Ned, you can, uh, I think, legitimately claim to be neutral in this battle between North and South Carolina because you were born up in North Carolina, raced out of South Carolina, and now you live back up in North Carolina again. Well, that is true, so I have allegiance to both states. There's Buddy Baker again. Buddy was in third place early in the race. He's now back in fifth and is three laps behind. Buddy, who, who what was it, a month, a month and a half ago, set a new speed record on that wild new track at Talladega. Yep, and seemed to be on his way to winning the Alabama 500 before the fiery crash that was seen on ABC Live World or ABC Sports. Bobby Isaac sitting in good position right now at the Darlington Raceway, which never in my memory has failed to develop spectacular action during the course of an afternoon. Ned, we have talked about it. The third turn, which used to be very treacherous, and the fourth turn, which is now treacherous. There seems to be something else about this track that generates this kind of action. Can you think of anything else? You know, the talk has gone for many years here that it is one of the most demanding and the most challenging racetracks on the entire circuit, but there's something they can talk about, all of the various turns and the problems they present, but there's something else somewhere that no one seems to have put their finger on. It's a, just a tremendous racetrack, and this is the reason it is so popular with the fans here in the South, man, the reason they turn out by the thousands on each race day. A couple of other characteristics of the track are that it is kind of narrow compared to the other super speedways, and that the banking is more shallow, is it not? Therefore, you have to drive more. Yes, it is, and particularly in the third and fourth turn. Of course, it's not uh, a complete oval, Jim. The first and second turns are much shorter than the third and fourth turns, and when they set the cars up, the mechanics and the car owners, for one turn, it doesn't mean that it'll necessarily work for the other turn. And this presents extra problems for them and really brings out uh, the versatility of a driver and being able to cope with the various situations on each turn. All right, we're trying to keep you up to date on many sports fronts this afternoon. We've now gotten word from Houston, the third round leader, they're all in now, and the leader is Bruce Crampton of Australia, who bogeyed the last hole, however, to finish four under. He is now just two shots ahead of Bert Green, who is two under par, and Jimmy Gilbert, who is also two under par. So, looks like quite a finish coming up tomorrow. Tomorrow, by the way, another very busy day for ABC Sports. At 3.30 Eastern time, you'll be seeing same-day coverage by satellite in color of the Grand Prix of Monaco, the fabled race through the streets of Monte Carlo on the shores of the Mediterranean. Prince's Grace and Prince Renier, no doubt, will be there. They always have been in the past. They sponsored the race over there. That'll be on our special racing series, 3.30 to 5 Eastern time, immediately followed by the Houston International Golf Tournament, also live. So another big day tomorrow. Bob Montgomery is down in the pit area. Bob? They say things, funny things happen at Darlington, and certainly you'd have to say that it happened here. Bobby Allison of Uertown, Alabama, led the first half of the race, and Bobby, you must have been feeling pretty good. Yeah, I was, Bob. In fact, I was riding along thinking, well, if I could lead the first half easily, that possibly I could win this thing. You uh, stayed in there for about 145 laps, and then what happened? Well, we'd run hot all day, but I thought I could get by with it. You know, the heat was up... Uh, quite high today and the humidity is probably pretty strong and I was trying to nurse it along keep the temperature down uh, reasonable but it, it just uh, I guess it just run too hot and uh, burnt the pistons up and when you came out other things started happening Pete you had your troubles we talked to you already about that but we're more interested we know that you were in with Richard Petty in the hospital and uh, probably can bring us a little bit more up to date on it well, uh, I wouldn't want to commit myself, but I will say this, that he did talk, and he was smiling a little bit. I think he's probably a little stiff, and he had a cut on his, uh, on his head just a little bit, but I think that uh, Richard's going to be all right, and I know that uh, there's a lot of people that probably watched it, and they're pretty well concerned about him, but uh, uh, he was talking with his wife, and I think that uh, he'll, be, he'll be a little sore, but all right. I don't guess anybody had a better seat at the race than uh, you two guys. Uh, would you care to comment on what kind of a race has it been? Well, uh, I thought the first part of the race was uh, pretty 
fast and exciting. Uh, we, as you know, we went uh, quite a good spell with no caution. And uh, the speeds were way up. The track was hot and a little slick, but you could still go real hard. And uh, I think uh, Pete and David Pearson, Isaac, Baker, and several of the others found the uh, same thing that I did, that uh, the biggest problem was just getting around the slower cars. And uh, other than that, we could run some real fast laps. But uh, I guess, like you say, when things started happening this afternoon, they seemed to happen to everybody. And I know I was just sitting there feeling sorry for myself of my misfortune. And then Pete topped mine, and then Richard came along and uh, outdid Pete as far as the uh, bad luck goes. So uh, just a bad day for a few of us, and I certainly hope that Richard is no more than just bruised up myself. The thing about it, you're going to need all the hands you can get back at Roundable, North Carolina. You have three wrecked cars now. Well, that's right. we got some uh, pretty serious repairing to do, so uh, we're going to have to get right to work. Either one of you want to venture on who's going to win? No, I, I wouldn't want to say so. No, I think it would be a good race, though. Back to you, Jim. Okay, that was Bob Montgomery with Bobby Allison and Pete Hamilton, two of the leading drivers who dropped out of the race earlier today, both in somewhat spectacular fashion. As indicated, Pete Hamilton is the teammate of Richard Petty. Both of them wrecked their cars today, and another of their big super speedway cars was wrecked earlier in the week by Richard Petty. Uh, Ned, how long would it take uh, an operation, even as well run as the Petty's, to get these cars back in shape for racing? Well, of course, the, pet, the car that Petty wrecked here today would be a, what you would say, a total loss. And it's considered to take about a thousand man hours to build one of these cars from start to finish. Of course, the car of Pete Hamilton, perhaps uh, 75 to 100 hours might put it back in condition. And the car that Petty wrecked earlier in the week, they said it could be a total loss. They had not been able to survey all of the damage of it. So they do have a lot of work. It'll be several weeks, I'm sure, before they'll have them all back in action. A tough week for the Petty clan. The leader in the race, remember, is Bobby Isaac in car number 71. He has a two and three-tenths seconds lead over David Pearson. They're the only cars on the same lap at this moment. The racing goes on, however, and we'll be back live in a minute. We return live and in color to the Rebel 400 at Darlington, South Carolina. There are the standings of the leaders. Bobby Isaac in first place, followed closely by David Pearson, who's on the same lap. A lap back is Cale Yarbrough in car number 27 in third place, and in fourth place, Richard Brooks, who is three laps down. Buddy Baker is fifth, just behind him. In fact, let's continue the standings a little bit. In, in sixth place, another place further back, is car number 48, James Hilton of Inman, South Carolina. Then number 72. Well, uh, number 72, I don't think... Yes, he got back into the action. Did they get Benny Parsons yeah. back yes. in the race? Okay, Benny Parsons was in a spectacular spin in the home stretch early in the race. They took him behind the pit wall, but he's back in the race and is now in eighth position. Behind Benny Parsons in number 72 comes number five, Buddy Arrington of Martinsville, Virginia. Then number 46, Roy Main of Sumter, South Carolina. Number 37, Dr. Don Sarr, medical doctor from Miami, Florida. Jim, we have a driver change in one of the cars. Car number 25 is now being driven by Earl Brooks. This car was started by Jay Thomas of Christiansburg, Virginia. Okay, and we're looking now at some of the other retirements in the race. Car number 31, Jim Van Diver of Charlotte, North Carolina, went out with distributor trouble. Number 68, Larry Bommel of Sparta, Wisconsin, had a broken windshield. That's real trouble, could have been. Number 23, Earl Brooks of Lynchburg, Virginia, with a drive shaft. Number 30, Dave Marcus of Skyland, North Carolina, with a piston. Number 24, Cecil Gordon of Arden, North Carolina, with an oil leak. Number 76, Ben Arnold of Fairfield, Alabama, went out with oil pressure. Leroy Yarborough, you remember, crashed into the wall in the fourth turn. Of course, Richard Betty is in the hospital after hitting the pit wall head-on and almost going through it. There's the leader, Bobby Isaac, in car number 71. You were on with us earlier. We uh, showed you an interview that Bob Montgomery had before the race with Bobby Isaac, in which he actually said, quite honestly, that he is afraid of this racetrack. Well, right now he's conquering both fear and the racetrack, and is the leader with 224 laps completed out of a scheduled 291. We're moving into the closing stages of this race now. Jim, I just blocked Bobby Isaac on the last lap, and he turned 151.8 miles per hour. And that's faster than the fellows expected to be running this late in the race. 
Isaac coming right at you down the home stretch at this moment, and that blue flag with the gold uh, stripe across it is the signal to a slower car to move over and let the leader go by. There is Cale Yarbrough in car number 27. He is in third place at the moment and one lap behind the two leaders, Bobby Isaac and David Pearson. Now there you saw 71 going back to 17, David Pearson. That was the distance between first and second place. Now back up to the leader again to Bobby Isaac. You can see this Oh, what would you say, about 150 yards, Ned? Yes, it actually uh, registered three seconds, Jim, the last time around. Three seconds is precious little time on a track like this. Live racing from South Carolina on a hot, early summer afternoon. There are the leaders. We'll be back in a minute. Standing still the same. Bobby Isaac, the leader. David Pearson, second. A lap behind Cale Yarbrough. Three laps behind Richard Brooks. This is Jim McKay, along with former NASCAR Grand National Driving Champion on two occasions, as a matter of fact, Ned Jarrett. Bob Montgomery is working with us down in the pit area. The leader, Bobby Isaac, incidentally, has not won a race so far this year, but he's finished in the top five and seven races, and in the top ten and another seven. He is second in the Grand National point standings to Richard Petty, and conceivably could take the lead by the time the race is over today. Isaac, so far this year, has won some $27,170. The distance between first and second place right now, between Isaac there, the leader, David Pearson, is three and two-tenths seconds. He may be stretching it out just a little bit. 229 laps have gone by. We're scheduled for 291. Track temperature, by the way, we will give you the air temperature, 90. The temperature on the track at race time is 155 degrees. And that is hot, Jim. In fact, uh, that is hotter than it normally is here for the Southern 500 on Labor Day. That's the temperature as far as the tires are concerned on the track surface. Inside the driver's compartment, as you watch Bobby Isaac working that wheel, it is not very much cooler. Now, the new NASCAR rule this year is that the cars must not have side windows. They used to run with the windows up. I was kind of surprised to find out that most of the fellas think it's hotter with the windows out than with the windows in there. Yes, they uh, seem to think the air, not only the outside air circulating in and through the car, but also the air that might come up off the tires and off the track itself coming into the car would make it hotter. They prefer to run with the windows up in the car. Of course, they can't do that now with the new ruling. Of course, there's uh, mixed feelings as far as this ruling is concerned. Some say that it's better, and some say that it's not as well. Of course, normally they would not run the windows here at Darlington anyway. Temperatures inside a car on a day like this have often been registered as high as 130 or 135 degrees, so the physical condition of these men has to be tremendous. We get word that Bobby Isaac is scheduled for a pit stop in four laps, according to present planning. I believe that would be a scheduled pit stop, Jim. They've been running about 45 to 50 laps on each uh, run under the green flag. What about the absence of windows as far as aerodynamics is concerned, Ed? You said they probably would be running with them down here anyway. So. Yes, because the aerodynamic uh, design of the car is not nearly as important here because the speeds aren't as high as they are at Talladega and Daytona. And they feel that the weight of uh, being closer to the ground rather than having the windows up high in the car would be more of an advantage than the aerodynamic design of having the windows in the cars. And so they would, if they were allowed to have the windows, they most likely would have them taken out for this particular race. When Ned indicated that the speeds are slower here, he really didn't mean that they're slow. They're around 150 miles an hour. As a matter of fact, I have a watch on Bobby Isaac right now. We'll try to give you what his speed is when he completes uh, another lap here. The speeds are, are relative, Jim. Of course, the track here is not nearly as long as Daytona and Talladega, so they can't reach the speeds, but it actually feels like you're going faster here than you do on uh, the track at Daytona and at Talladega. Again, we would indicate only two cars are on the same lap. That's Bobby Isaac and David Pearson in number 71 and 17. Well, I got a timing on Bobby, 32 and 6 tenths seconds. We've come to 151.840 miles an hour. That's pretty fast at this stage of the race. Yes, it is. It's uh, less than two miles an hour off the qualifying record that was set by Charlie Gordon back here earlier in the week. Fantastic racing here in the Southland. Let's take a look at the relationship between those two cars. There you saw Isaac, and back over here is David Pearson. 
I believe Isaac is pulling away. I'll put the clock on him as he comes by this time and just see what he is in seconds. 36 cars started, 16 are now running. Now 236 out of a 291 laps gone. Isaac has built up a six second lead over Pearson now. He's pulling away. So pretty soon David Pearson may need the benefit of a yellow flag of some sort in order to start catching up with Isaac again. Another thing that we might note with Isaac scheduled to come into the pits, and in fact he's coming into the pits right now, and we'll put the clocks on him and see how long he's in here, Jim. And uh, the pit crew of Pearson is one of the fastest in the business, not meaning to take anything away from Harry Hyde and the fellows who pit Bobby Isaac's car. There he is stopped, and of course they're going to change the right side tires. According to the NASCAR rules, they're only allowed five men over the wall to work on these cars. And you see the fellow cleaning the windshield. He's not considered over the wall, but he is cleaning the windshield. Of course, they're handing Bobby Isaac a drink of water or uh, his favorite soft drink while they're changing the tires, of course, and putting in gasoline. They've worked rather rapidly on this car, so it looks like he has a good pit stop going, and there he goes out, and the time on that was 23 and one-tenth seconds, which is, excuse me, 22 and one-tenth seconds, which is a fantastic pit stop on a hot day like today. Very fast pit stop for Bobby Isaac, and very soon we'd expect that this car, number 17, David Pearson, would also have to come in. At the moment, however, 17, David Pearson, has become the leader. But remember, very soon he must pit. And it depends how fast his pit stop is compared to this car, Bobby Isaacs, who will be the leader as the pit stop is completed. This is a battle, by the way, of manufacturers also. Bobby Isaac, 1969 Dodge Daytona, and David Pearson in a 1969 Ford. It's Dodge against Ford out there right now. And this is always a battle, and particularly to the fans all over the country, this is one thing that this sport has, Jim, that a lot of other sports, uh, in fact, no other sport has to offer. Not only the competition of the athletes, the individuals themselves, and the teamwork of the teams that take care of these cars, but also in the various makes of automobiles. And, of course, people have a lot of pride in the cars that they drive, and they identify these cars out on the racetrack. Okay. Yes, we see Buddy Baker is in trouble. Car number six. Evidently, he's going out of the race. Yes, he is being pushed behind the pit wall. The race goes on, and we'll be back live and in color in South Carolina in another minute. Darlington, South Carolina. The leader in the Rebel 400 at this moment is David Pearson in car number 17, and there he is. In second place, Bobby Isaac in car number... 71, although and technically at this moment, Cale Yarborough, number 27, has moved into second place. But that is because neither David Pearson nor Cale Yarborough has pitted. Number 71, Bobby Isaac here, has already made his scheduled pit stop. He will either be just in front or just behind David Pearson in all probability when Pearson makes his scheduled pit stop. As for Yarborough here in car number 27, uh, he's uh, going to be at least a lap behind by the time this pit stop business is finished. But Cale is in Second place at this moment should be around third when the pit stops are completed. Again, if you've just joined us, Richard Petty, one of the big names in American stock car racing, was in a spectacular and serious crash here when he crashed head-on into the pit wall oh, a good many laps ago now. He has been taken to the hospital, further reports from the exact hospital and from members of his own family, or that he does not appear to be hurt too seriously. He is conscious, he is talking may have something like a broken or sprained left arm and the moment that he left the racetrack that was all that was apparent we're waiting for further reports from the Darlington Hospital now into the pits number 32 Richard Brooks last year's NASCAR rookie of the year running in fourth position as he comes in in fifth place at the moment is car number 48 James Hilton one of the most determined of the independent operators Gary Arborough has come into the pits, number 27. So he will not be in second place as he was a couple of moments ago as the, the pit stop story unfolds. What we're waiting for now, really, is for David Pearson to come into the pits. Here's Richard Brooks. 245 laps gone. It's a schedule 291. And Jim, Richard Brooks didn't have quite as good a pit stop as Bobby Isaac. He was in the pits for 28 and 6 tenths seconds. And at the speed they're running out here today, that's a lot of difference. Quick word that it's always good to have our friends in Canada with us watching on the CTV network this afternoon. ABC's Wide World of Sports bringing you one of the major sports events of this weekend, the Rebel 400 from South Carolina. There's Bobby Isaac closing in again on the leader, David Pearson and David's Got to make that pit stop pretty soon. 
big weekend on ABC Sports. Already today, you saw the third round of the Houston Champions International Golf Tournament. Tomorrow, you'll see the final round of that tournament, along with same-day satellite color coverage of the Grand Prix of Monaco, the race through the streets of Monte Carlo. That'll be at 3.30 to 5 Eastern Time. The leader, David Pearson, Bobby Isaac second. Nobody else on the same lap. Gail Yarbrough is third now, a lap behind. Richard Brooks is fourth in car number 32, and James Hilton, number 48, is fifth. The Ford of Pearson has been able to go a little bit longer here this afternoon, Jim, before making a pit stop. Of course, this could uh, turn to be an advantage to him if a caution should happen to come out, although he's only able to go some five or six laps longer than the Dodge automobiles of Isaac and when Bobby Allison was in the pit. David Pearson, the leader at the moment, is the defending NASCAR Grand National Champion. He won the 1969 title. So far this year, he isn't doing too well. He's way down in 16th position in the year-long point standings. However, he's only been in five races. He finished in the top five in two of them and the top ten in another two. He has not, however, won a race so far this year. Neither has Bobby Isaac. Pearson has won, however, more than $30,000. So one place high in the important races. Yes, he has. He finished second in the rich Daytona 500 in February, and I believe he was third at Talladega in the 500 there, so these two races alone have put quite a bit of money into the bank for him. Of course, he was in the hospital earlier in the year with an operation, Jim, and was out of action for several weeks and missed some of the bigger money the paying races, and also since he came back has chose not to run in some of the races. Last year, of course, winning the Grand National Championship, he ran in every race that was on the NASCAR schedule, as did Isaac, and Isaac came away with the most wins in 1969, having won 17 of the Grand National races. Of course, the majority of those won by Isaac were on the short tracks of NASCAR. The only super speedway win in his career came last year at Texas in December. Then we're going to try to take a look at the fourth turn right here because uh, we know before the race was a dangerous one and we've seen two of the top drivers. Here is the fourth turn. We've seen two of the top drivers crash here. First, Leroy Yarbrough and then the wild spectacular crash of Richard Petty. Brad, can you tell us a little something about this fourth turn and why it's so hard? The banking is higher now in the third and fourth turn as we see Pearson coming around the third turn and entering the fourth turn. You see that he goes up close to the wall and then dips down low and sets himself to come off of that turn and then drifts out close to the wall. He didn't get as close that time as we normally see him as he comes off of that turn. But evidently he has picked himself a groove to come around there to where he does not get uh, have too much trouble coming off. But the speed that they're able to generate coming off of the long third turn can put them in a very hairy position as they come off the number four turn. Of course, that cement wall is staring them in the face. There's quite a turn to make as they come off the turn. How would you best describe the problem there? Is it that it's more of a dog leg? It's more towards the right angle of the turn than a normally uh, curved turn? Yes, I would say so. And it comes up so quickly on you, Jim, as you come out of that turn. And the fact that you have been able to generate a lot of speed uh, normally once you decelerate to go into one turn and start coming off of another one, you're able to just hold it wide open all the way off. But this turn, the fourth turn here at Darlington, is so different. And it is, it's just a sharp turn as they come off of the, uh, and start down the straightaway off of the number four turn. With the race going on and David Pearson still not having pitted, we're going to go for another report in the pit area to Bob Montgomery. Is this the last one you're going to have to make? Yes, we can go the rest of the way, Bob. You're just a fraction behind uh, Pearson. He still has to make a pit stop. Well, I noticed they just put up the sign now. And uh, if he pits, I don't think we'll have any trouble from here on. I just hope our boss at Fort Wayne, Indiana, Mr. Cross, because I thought he, I thought, I'm glad he, I hope that he's watching, and I hope he's pleased with the car. Okay, excuse me, Bob, but here comes David Pearson into the pits right now. David Pearson is no longer the leader as Bobby Isaac whips by him. Let's see how long this pit stop will be, Ned. Okay, I have the clock on him. Actually, Isaac has to go around and come around him again before he'll take the lead, Jim, because he was one lap down. Of course, he should have plenty of time to do this while they're servicing the car of David Pearson. You see them putting in the gasoline and tires, but that was a fast pit stop. As a matter of fact, 
17 and a half seconds in the pits. Fantastic. I was anticipating a little bit on Isaac Bassett, but certainly should. But right now, Pearson is on the track, still getting up speed. Isaac at full speed is up by between turns one and two and has taken the lead. Isaac is back out in front, oh, by several hundred yards already over David Pearson, but that was a tremendously quick pit stop. Yes, it was. Pearson gained about five seconds on Isaac in the pits at that time, and of course that can make a lot of difference. Right now, he's sitting only about a second behind before the pit stop started, before Isaac made his pit stop. He was six seconds ahead of Pearson. Great pit crew work by the crew of David Pearson. 258 laps are gone. The total in the race, 291. Back for more live racing in a minute. We're back again live, covering the Rebel 400 in color from Darlington, South Carolina. And there's been another development. David Pearson there is still the leader in the race. However, when we left you, he was just a matter of feet ahead of Bobby Isaac in car number 71. While we were away, Isaac hit the wall on the second turn. Not badly, but enough apparently to blow a tire. He had to come in the pits, make an unscheduled pit stop, and has now dropped two laps behind David Pearson. So Isaac, who appeared to be in clover on his way to repassing Pearson and taking the lead, is now in big trouble. Yes, he lost those two laps, uh, having to come into the pits and change tires. And actually, Jim, he doesn't seem to be running as we've seen him let another car go around him there, Richard Brooks. He does not seem to be running as fast as he was before. Evidently, it has affected the handling of that car. And also, while uh, this was happening, Cale Yarborough pulled behind the wall. He was only one lap behind the leaders, and he is now out of the race. All right, well, now let's go back. Let's go on videotape to watch this car, number 71, that you're watching live at the moment. Watch him as he hit the wall here just a minute or two ago. Here we come in the second turn, and there's Bobby right up against the wall. You see smoke coming up, uh, cement dust, and more than anything else, I think. And the front of his car is working. Yes, it appeared there was no major uh, sheet metal damage to the side of the car as he came out of the pits, Jim, but uh, that must have blown a tire, or either he could have blown a tire that caused him to go into the wall to start with. And there is Bobby Isaac five again. And uh, Jim, he was the leader uh, at the point he went into the wall, actually, when he came out of the pits. He's coming back into the pits now, but after their scheduled pit stops, he beat Pearson and, uh, of course, was the leader just by some 50 yards before he went into the wall. The average speed of the race right to this point, 128.238, and that includes many laps run under the yellow flag because of various accidents. The principal one, the one to Richard Petty, which sent him to the hospital, hospital. We still have no report from the downtown hospital. Track hospital reports, remember, from his father and from his brother and from a NASCAR official were that he did not appear to be seriously injured and was conscious and was talking. But David Pearson is all by himself now. 264 laps have gone by. Total laps in the race, 291. Racing under the green flag, he has made what should be his final pit stop of the afternoon, so all he's got to do is keep it moving, Ned. Yes, David uh, certainly knows this racetrack. He has won this race uh, once before, and going into this race today, he was second only about $6,000 behind Richard Petty as far as total earnings on the super speedways. In second place at the moment now is Richard Brooks, who has gone ahead of Bobby Isaac as Bobby Isaac repitted. Richard Brooks is three laps, however, behind the leader. And there is Isaac going back out again. And there's the leader, David Pearson. And Isaac, Isaac is four laps behind now, the leader. There's news for the pit area. Bob Montgomery. Right alongside is uh, Dick Hutchison. Dick, I guess you feel pretty good right now, don't you? Well, we do at this point, Bob. We've got about a three-lap lead. Bobby Isaac got a little trouble. We've run real good all day. The trouble we've had this week, I think we deserve it. Uh, looks like Pearson overcame a little bit of that fight of the first turn. Well, I think we got a mess, and we um, got a little minor hanging there this morning. We didn't know how it worked, but it turned out real well. If you look at the record book, it says if you want to win Darlington, bring a Ford, second, a Puma. Ford, right now, is in the lead. Back to you, Jeff. Okay, Bob. I think the main thing... Well, that was Dick Hutchison who had another word, which couldn't quite hear. Dick Hutchison in the pit crew, and one of the strategists for David Pearson, and a former very fine NASCAR driver himself. 24 laps to go, and we'll be back to watch them live in a minute. Jim McKay reporting with Ned Jarrett and Bob Montgomery on the Rebel 400. There you see the leader is David Pearson. He's not only the leader, he is long laps ahead of the second place car, 
Bobby Isaac. Now that's that's on your scoreboard right now, but I don't. I, I believe that's an error. I believe the second place car is Richard Brooks, car number 32. Richard Brooks is second in car number 32. Bobby Isaac is third in car number 71. There's Richard Brooks right now. He's three laps behind the leader. Bobby Isaac is five laps out of first place. The leader, again, is David Pearson in his familiar car, number 17. David, 35-year-old race driver from Spartanburg, South Carolina. The father of Larry, Rick, and Eddie Pearson. Three sons. David, the defending NASCAR Grand National Champion. There he was, flashing by. He has won the Grand National Championship three times, and that tied a mark that Lee Petty established back in the 1950s. Last year, David Pearson was in 51 races, 111, and finished in the top five on 42 occasions. Just a tremendous year. He earned $183,700, second highest money season in the history of the sport. The first highest, of course, was also last year. That was Leroy Yarborough. So David Pearson is having himself quite a career. Jim, going into this race today at the Darlington Raceway, Pearson had entered 16 races and had been in the top uh, five on 10 occasions, the top 10 on 12 occasions, and had earned $80,095, which is on the second to Richard Petty's record here, of which Petty had won $104,000 prior to today's running off the Rebel 400. There's an interesting sidelight on Richard Brooks being in second place in this race right now. Earlier today, he not only made an unscheduled pit stop, but his car actually had to be pulled behind the wall, as Ned Jarrett explained at the time. Uh, this usually means that you're out of the race. However, it can mean that the NASCAR officials say if it's going to take more than a few seconds, it's going to be a matter of minutes to try to fix your car, you've got to go behind the wall. Well, he did go behind, and he must have been back there, what, five or six minutes? Yes, so he, he was. out of it, and here he is in second place. Uh, fortunately for him, the, left, the time that he was behind the wall all came under the caution flag, and, of course, he didn't lose nearly as much time had they been under the green flag. Again, there are long miles between first and second and between second and third. That's Richard Brooks in second place. Here is the third place car of Bobby Isaac. Brooks is three laps behind David Pearson, right here, the leader. And Bobby Isaac is five laps behind. The fourth place car is James Hilton in number 48. He is nine laps out of first place. And in fifth place at the moment, we have number 72, Benny Parsons of Detroit, Michigan. Another case of never give up in automobile racing because he spun out on the home stretch that was in the pits for quite a while and now he's back in fifth place these fellows know that anything can happen in an automobile race and if they can get back in they know that they have a chance to finish in a relatively high position and jim there's some pretty good money down the line and they're anxious to stay in there and get as much of it as they possibly can 274 laps have gone by Total schedule, 291. We're really in the closing stage now. 275 now as the leader goes past the finish line again. That's the third place car you're looking at at the moment. Remember tomorrow, tremendous action again through the facilities of ABC Sports. At 3.30 Eastern time, same day coverage by satellite of the Grand Prix of Monaco. The Formula One race through the streets of Monte Carlo. If you've never seen it, it is one of the great spectacular uh, romantic sites, I might even say, in sports. The Grand Prix of Monaco, Bill Fleming and Bill Hill will be over there reporting it on our special racing series, and it'll be same day color satellite coverage at 3.30 to 5 Eastern Time tomorrow, immediately followed over many of these stations by the final round of the Houston Champions International Golf Tournament, which at the moment is led by Bruce Crampton. However, he's leading just by two shots over Bert Green and Gibby Gilbert, so that should be quite a finish. At the moment, we're still live bringing you the Rebel 400 with 15 laps to go. 15 to go for David Pearson. And the first prize money of more than $15,000 will be his. Should he win, it will be his first victory of the 1970 season. As Ned indicated, he was injured, however, early in this year. Got off to a slow start, but he's really charging now. Yes, he is. Actually, uh, he was not injured, Jim. He was in the hospital as a result of a couple of operations that did not pertain to racing. Hospitalized, I should say. I, yes. The word injury is on my mind because of things that have happened here today. We'll be back in a minute, live at Darlington. See the standings, David Pearson, Richard Brooks, Bobby Isaac, and James Hilton. But we have a report from the hospital. This is from the doctors now on Richard Petty, who crashed into the pit wall head-on earlier today. He has a dislocated shoulder and a chipped bone within the shoulder. He has some cuts, not serious ones, on his face. But the big news is 
Richard is expected to be dismissed from the hospital tomorrow. Is that good news, Ned? It certainly is, Jim. It's the best news we've had here all the afternoon because Richard Petty is certainly one of the finest stock car drivers in the world and one of the most popular ones. And I know the many fans across the country who has Petty as a household word are happy to hear this news, too. Richard, for a long time, has been perhaps the most popular driver. One barometer of how uh, popular a driver is down here in the NASCAR circuit is the number of kids around the track who wear a T-shirt, not with his name on them or his picture, but just his number. That's all you have to have down here. And you see hundreds of kids at every race with number 43 on their T-shirts. And that's for Richard Petty, who is okay, will be out of the hospital tomorrow. It was one of the worst crashes that you weren't with us earlier. Uh, that we've seen in a long time. Uh, Ned and I and everybody here in the booth had grave doubts about the, what the condition of Richard Petty might be. Unconscious at first, his helmet was squeezed between the uh, door of his car and the roof, which had caved in despite the roll cage. But it was the roll cage and the helmet almost certainly to save him. There's no doubt about it, Jim. There's tremendous help to him in that situation. There's Bobby Isaac in third place. There are now nine laps left in the race, nine for the leader. There's the second place car, Dick Brooks, number 32, Californian. And number 17, David Pearson, the South Carolinian, leading the race in his home state. Be lots of cheers for him here, it appears, very soon. At less than nine laps to go in the race. Eight, eight laps to go. Pearson has made nine pit stops so far this afternoon. Crew chief Dick Hutcherson and his men have done a tremendous job with the last pit stop that gave him a fighting chance against Bobby Isaac. But then, of course, when Isaac hit the wall and had trouble with his car, that became academic. He took a long lead and he is still holding. There you see the man in the car. A little easier to see the driver this year on television because of the new rule that they must race with no side windows in the car. That's not the reason for it, let me just show you. But it's safety. Yes, it is. Uh, there was an accident in Daytona, Jim, in February that uh, when the car hit a wall, it scattered glass all over the track, and they had a tremendous job in getting the glass uh, cleaned up from the track. Of course, uh, that is one of the safety factors involved. Okay, well, you saw the first and second place cars on that split screen, and we'll be back in a minute with the finish of the Rebel 400. And five for David Pearson to win the Rebel 400, but you're watching live and in color from Darlington, South Carolina this afternoon on ABC's Wide World of Sports. David Pearson with a long three-lap lead over the second-place car, number 32 of Richard Brooks, with a six-lap lead now over third-place car number 71, Bobby Isaac. And now there are four laps to go, less than four for this car. David Pearson of Spartanburg, South Carolina, the defending Grand National Champion on the NASCAR circuit in his 1969 Ford, qualified third fastest for this race at a speed of 153.246 miles per hour. His average speed this afternoon considerably less than that, but that's primarily because of long laps of yellow flag under which they've had to race. There's the move over flag for a slower car. Less than three laps to go. Ned, are these kind of anxious moments in their own way, just making sure that engine sounds right and everything's all right? Yes, they are, Jim. In fact, you can hear a lot of noises that perhaps are not there in a condition like this. He knows all he has to do is finish this race and he can win it. But he starts hearing uh, sometimes a lot of little extra noises, wondering if that engine is missing, if it's still performing uh, to its very best. And I, but I'm sure that Pearson is, uh, has a pretty good feeling right now, knowing that he just has a couple more laps to go. You said listening for something. I had an interesting conversation with Buddy Baker before the race today. I asked him why he didn't wear earplugs. He said, because my ears can help me sometimes. He said, aside from my hands and feet running the car, he said, I got three senses to help me. My sight to watch, my nose to smell with, interestingly, to smell if anything's wrong with the car, and my ears to hear with. And I want to use them all. Very definitely. They can, can smell if the car should start uh, smoking or... Uh, something of this nature, a lot of times they can smell, and then, of course, uh, hearing is very important. David Pearson should get the white flag, and there it is. The white flag is out, meaning one lap to go for you, and you're the winner. We're at Darlington, South Carolina. Another colorful moment in the wide world of sports. To reach the little hamlet of Darlington, you drive about two hours southeast from Charlotte, North Carolina. Through places called Pageland and Jefferson and McBee and past very colorful road signs. 
And then you reach the Darlington Raceway, one of the meccas of automobile racing, where right now David Pearson is about to take the checkered flag. It'll be victory in the Rebel 400, his second victory in this race. There it is. It's all over. He won this race two years ago, and now he has won again. We'll be back, hopefully, for a word with the winner in a minute. Bob Montgomery is down with the winner. Go, Bob. Here's the winner, David Pearson. David, what kind of a race? Well, Bob, is a real good race. In fact, I'm sorry that uh, Bob Isaac had to dribble right there at the end of the race because I think it would have been a real close win on him. Did you have any real problems out there, David? It was a bad week. It started off real bad for you, but it wound up real good. Yes, uh, for, of course, the last couple of days I had pretty bad, but we changed everything on the car last night, and uh, luckily we, everything was just perfect. I was kidding Isaac earlier when he said uh, I would not hit the wall, you know, so I told him I hit it during the week, and... Uh, saving it for today, so he get it today. David Pearson, the winner, now back to you, Jim McKay. Thanks very much, Bob. David Pearson, the winner by three laps over Richard Brooks, by nine laps over Bobby Isaacs, by 12 laps over James Hilton and Benny Parsons. Those are the results. Next Saturday, 5 p.m. Eastern and Pacific Time, 4 Central Time on Wide World of Sports, the Indianapolis 500 time trials from the Great Speedway in Indianapolis. We'll be on same day, videotape coverage of the first day of qualifications at Indianapolis and the pole position winner beginning at 6 o'clock Eastern Daylight Time next Saturday. Now, that'll be on at 6 o'clock. The show starts at 5 o'clock, but the report on the time trials will be 6 o'clock Eastern Time on Wide World of Sports. In addition, you'll see us uh, naming our ABC's Wide World of Sports Athlete of the Year for 1969. We'll also have Japanese kickboxing. There's a new sport for us, even on Wide World from Tokorozawa City Auditorium in Japan, one of the wildest events we've ever seen, where boxers are permitted to land blows with their legs and feet in addition to their hands. Also next week, the Mexican 1000 Cross Country Road Racing Championship, which you liked earlier, from Baja, California, Mexico. Leading field of road racing enthusiasts competing over a rugged 1,000-mile course from Ensenada to La Paz. All that next week. This week, Johnny Reb is indicating that David Pearson is the winner of the 1970 Rebel 400. The executive producer of ABC's Wide World of Sports is Rune Arley. The coordinating producer, Jim Spence. Rebel 400 produced by Doug Wilson. And today's program was directed by Lou Volpicelli. Our associate producer was Bryce Wiseman. Associate directors, Joe Assetti, Bernie Hoffman, and Ronald Hawkins. Technical directors, Walt Kubelis and Al Smith. My personal thanks, as always, to John Cooper here with us in the booth, who is invaluable. Remember, tomorrow afternoon here on ABC, an exciting doubleheader, the Grand Prix of Monaco by satellite beginning at 3.30 Eastern Time, followed by the final round of the Houston Champions International Golf Tournament. And next Saturday, once again, on Wide World of Sports, Indy 500 Time Trials. That'll be on at the 6 p.m. segment of Wide World Eastern Time. Also, the Athlete of the Year, Japanese Kickboxing, and the Mexican 1000 Cross Country Road Racing Championships.